Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Spectra. We have Molly Rector. She's the Chief Marketing Officer at the company. Molly, how are you doing today? I'm doing super. Thanks, Rich. Well, thanks for coming on, Molly. You know, uh, coming off of supercomputing here, I didn't even get a chance to stop by and see what was new. Maybe we should start there. I mean, what's new with Spectra at SC13? Yeah, at the show, we were showing our traditional storage equipment, the tape libraries and our archive-grade NAS disk. But what we announced that was new was the expansion of the IBM Enterprise Tape Drive technology to a broader set of our product line, which you know, on the surface probably doesn't sound that interesting. But what's pretty cool about it is we're starting to see that the higher capacity media, both in disk and tape, are really necessary in archive environments, that lots of data is growing really quickly. Folks are wanting to efficiently store that data for the long term when it's not being utilized, but still is being stored. And one of the holes that the market has had is the high capacity tape storage media, um, the TS1140 format that is offered by Spectra and IBM was only available in the really big enterprise systems. So the big supercomputing sites could utilize it but the smaller offices, the broader HPC environments like oil and gas and research that didn't need a super, super big exabyte size um, system couldn't use highest capacity media. So it would be kind of like saying only the big guys can use the six terabyte disk drives when they come out. We were kind of doing that in tape. So now we have the option that the high capacity tape media is available to um, all organization sizes. And with the trends that are coming in 2014, um, we really think that's going to be important as as the data usage models start to change. Yeah, yeah. So these TS1140s, Molly, are, are you said they're six terabytes a piece? Uh, they're four terabytes four right ter- now. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, they're a four terabyte native um, with about a three to one compression on reasonable on typical data sets. Okay. Okay, and they have some headroom sounds like there that you just leaked out that they're, they might go higher, you think? Oh, they will, yeah. yeah. They're, yeah if you look at the roadmaps, the TS-1140 has been on the market for several years, and there's definitely roadmaps to moving on to the 1150 and the 1160 in the coming years. So there definitely will be some some interesting capacity expansions in the coming years as well. Okay, well, that, that's great. I mean, that you don't need a giant library to get uh, uh, the highest capacity available cartridges now. Exactly. So, okay. Now you can have a kind of mid-sized library that can store over a petabyte of information in a rack-mountable kind of half a rack, which is pretty amazing that you can kind of store that much data in a small data center environment. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Well, along those lines, Molly, you guys sent me a, a top 10 predictions for 2014, and, and I think we should go through that because I think number 10 really speaks to what you just described. It did. It was a good segue into that, actually. You'd think we had planned that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, the as we went through our predictions for next year, one of the big things that we see is that um, the total capacity of tape storage technology shipments will continue to increase, but the amount of data center space and the number of individual units will continue to decrease. So more data is going to end out on tape, but people are going to be looking at more efficient ways to get that data on tape in as small a format with as little power as possible. Yeah, because uh, the, the information explosion just keeps going ramping up. And uh, that makes sense. And it actually, uh, looking at your number nine, are you really are you thinking there's going to be increasing, um, you know, uptake in the use of tape just in general? I do. Yeah. That if you start to look at how people are using their data and why they're keeping it, mm-hmm. um, there's it depends on the organization, but eighty to ninety five percent of the data that organizations are storing is very inactive. It's not changing data. It's only being queried on the occasional basis, and even in big data analytics environments, it's their metadata that's being utilized. They're not actually touching the files every day when they're doing their their big data searches. So I absolutely think that the organizations have good economic reasons to keep their data, but those economic reasons um, need to extend off to the storage media so that they can be storing the data in the most cost-effective, power-efficient way possible, and that absolutely is on tape. So we are seeing really interesting new interfaces to tape to make this all possible. If it tape acted like a difficult to access offline storage medium that only specialists know how to access, it wouldn't be possible. So to get, take advantage of 
the economics, the density, the power efficiency. The tape industry has done a lot to make it usable in a more traditional storage way to make it all possible. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to, like, go into some archive recovery system to, to find the file, and you can make it much more uh, readily available, sounds like. Exactly, yeah, and it just comes down to tape storage medium. The benefits of it are great, but the usability has to be what users want as well for them to continue to put more and more data on it. And, and those advancements have happened over the last couple of years that make it very um, very reasonable to predict that the usage of tape will continue to increase in lots of different markets in the coming year. Yeah, yeah. So so as we look to, to number eight, it sounds like as they do that, they're going to want to do that efficiently with the highest capacity kind of uh, devices they can. Exactly. So just like you see the disk drive industry continuing to increase the capacity of disk drives on a fairly quick basis, the tape industry is focusing on doing the same thing that as the data explosion is if an organization has 1.5 to 2x as much data next year as they had this year, they need their storage capacities keeping at a kind of similar trajectory. So the focus on um, higher capacity um, tape media being used in more broad applications where historically they've only been used in very specialist applications, I think we'll see um, as a big shift in the coming year. Yeah. And, and Molly, as, as these capacities go up, I mean, is the speed going up? Uh, certainly not at the same level, but uh, I mean, because otherwise it would take you forever to get that data back out, wouldn't it? It would. So that's one of the reasons that we see the adoption of this TS-1140 drive in in our libraries, even in the mid-range, being increasingly important, that it has about twice the throughput of an LTO drive. And so they're, they're ramping up their throughput at a similar rate to the, um, to the rate that they're increasing their capacity, where LTO is a um, slower increase in the um, generation to generation throughput, but it's an open standard that has some advantages as well in that you can buy source from multiple vendors and there's some intercompatibility across vendors. So they, they have different use cases. The high performance, really big environments with big throughput, these enterprise drives are something that really makes sense to them. And then there's other organizations in the general IT space where sharing, um, having an open standard is really important. So I think we're just going to see um, users buying the different technologies for different reasons in the coming years versus just going to LTO as the de facto standard. Yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of that, your number seven talks about uh, standards like the RESTful interface and something that you guys have developed uh, uh, some new products and technologies for. We have. We think that the web protocols, um, RESTful interfaces, and the concepts of making it very easy to write applications to move data to storage, and whether that storage is solid state disk, hard disk drives, or tape, is irrelevant. That what organizations really want is their students, their developers, their engineers to be able to write custom applications that can leverage all this data that they're storing and the RESTful web type of protocols that are utilized across the internet to share data across the internet really need to be um, native within the storage to make it easy to access the storage. So the idea of object storage spanning um, not only to use RESTful interfaces as they're interfaced, but also the object storage being able to span to be able to store hundreds of thousands to billions of files in ways that file systems start to have a hard time with. File systems aren't really designed to store many, many petabytes and billions of billions of files, especially if you're talking NFS or something like that. So new interfaces to storage and being able to organize all these files in a way that um, is realistic for the coming years is a huge shift that we're seeing. And making it native to the storage instead of requiring an appliance or a third-party software package to make it happen keeps the cost down and the simplicity there as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you guys, at what your product was called the Black Pearl, as I recall. To that effect. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Black Pearl is the object storage interface to our tape libraries, and we call the RESTful interface the the interface that the developers developed to is called DS3, which is an expansion on the traditional S3 interface that's used by Amazon Web Services. Yeah. Okay. So so it's on number six. Uh, you know, I think this all follows, but uh, online data repositories are going to become more commonplace, like these huge ones that like maybe like Blue Waters had, uh, you're right. going to see more and more of these, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. I think that if you take the marketing lingo out of it, whether you call it big data or 
or analytics of data. I think what really is driving this trend is the cost per gigabyte of storage has increasingly gone down over the last 10 years, 20 years probably. But certainly, it's become affordable to be able to keep your data for the long term. And in parallel, there's all these technologies that businesses are starting to be able to realize to use analytics of the data to be able to get some value out of it, to make good business decisions off of it, decide where to market next. Where in the past, data was really kept as just an insurance policy. It was just in case the CEO deleted an email or just in case you got audited or there was a litigation request. So it was not strategic to the business. It was an insurance policy to keep their data. Now businesses see it as an asset that they can use to help drive revenues in the future. So that's why the big shift to keeping a lot of data for a long time is it can help them grow their revenues. Yeah. So so along those lines, uh, you know, uh, Molly, I was all over the show floor at SC13, and everybody was talking about big data, whether it was a university or whatever. And uh, uh, it looks like you know people are using Hadoop more and more for HPC as well as the enterprise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so and the trend number five we were talking about, large-scale Hadoop deployments will become um, more common, but they're also going to be starting to look for best practices that – if you look at the Hadoop file system, the generation, the version 2 is just coming out, and it's just starting to get some of the features that you would traditionally expect to see in GPFS or L- Luster or any of those kinds of file systems. So while Hadoop is starting to mature, organizations are starting to look at ways to not make them kind of the science project that somebody's just investigating, how could I use Hadoop, but actually starting to put them into production sharing best practices around how to leverage the the capabilities of Hadoop, figuring out how to tier data in Hadoop. Right now, it only has the capability to use a single tier of storage, where most big online um, repositories of data have at least two and sometimes three or four tiers of storage. So I think you'll also see a lot of the Hadoop deployments starting to introduce storage tiering once more data is being um, managed within the system. And, and then, Molly, as we look to number four, you know, with the Hadoop usage increasing in, in the enterprise for production, what does Spectra bring to the table there? Do you help them back that up, or is that more of a future kind of thing? Yeah, so what Spectra introduced with our Black Pearl appliance, if you think about the way Hadoop talks to its storage, it uses a RESTful protocol, so it speaks to its storage over um, S3 as an example. So the capability to expand um, the capability of Hadoop to use a tier, different tiers of storage is what we announced in our product line back in October. So leveraging the Black Pearl DS3 technology in Hadoop makes it possible to only keep the data that's actively being analyzed in the active cluster, and then you can tier it out into um, a near-line type of storage with our Black Pearl, and you can replicate it off-site for backup disaster recovery purposes. And those are the kinds of features that the enterprise will expect in their environments. They're used to having built-in data protection, built-in tiering in their products, where Hadoop, as it's being um, tested in HPC in some cases, that's not been as important. Um, But those kinds of features are really important as they move into the general enterprise environment. Sure, sure. So as we look to number three here, Molly, about the DS3 interface, I I forgot to ask, does this have an open source component, DS3, or how does it work? Yeah, that's a good question. So right now, DS3 is stored, all the APIs and developers' tools are stored on our um, SpectraLogic developers' community, which requires a login. And we're doing that as the technology, which has just been on the market now for about two months, actually, precisely two months. We want to have a little bit of interaction with the developers, understand how they're using the technology and issues that they may be having. So they have a direct tie to our engineering team. But over the next quarter or two, you'll see us starting to introduce or release some of these pieces into open source. There will be DS3 clients. Specifically, there's one for Hadoop that will release into the open community. And over the next year, you'll definitely see us continuing to move in that direction, kind of a crawl, walk, run kind of um, strategy for SpectraLogic and moving into the open source market. (laughs) Right, right. So that speaks to number two. I mean, when you start something new uh, like DS3, it takes time to get traction, doesn't it? It does. It does. But one of the very interesting things to me about RESTful development, web services development, SOAP APIs, those types of tools, they all kind of fit in the same bucket, is they're not standards. They're not going through standards committee. The ANSI standards aren't necessarily being um, driven. Instead, 
they're open source and the fact that developers are using them and contributing to them is what makes them a standard, so to speak, kind of putting that in quotes. But it takes some time. It takes developers using it, um, writing their own code, and then wanting to contribute back to the community to really get critical mass where it's utilized and easy to download and access. So those RESTful interfaces do take time to get adopted, but the great thing is if you make it easy to develop to these interfaces, you have the hundreds and thousands of developers around the world who have all kinds of different crazy projects that they can conceive of and they can write their own tie to their storage without having to wait for a standard to be written. They can just write their own tie today and be off and running tomorrow. So once you get some adoption, the, adop the curve to usage is very, very fast. Yeah, yeah. And so we've, we've come to uh, um, the David Letterman number one trend for 2014 <laughs> is the need for deep storage as a new storage tier. And is this addressing a, a gap, you think, in the marketplace? I do. So it really is kind of wrapping up all the things that we've been talking about that users are wanting to keep data for a longer term. They need native interfaces to their storage that um, can tie to web type applications. They need low cost storage. They need to be able to keep their data for the long, time, long term in different tiers of storage. And what deep storage really offers is um, it wraps all that up into a single um, product market that's available now. The deep storage market is storage that can, in a kind of cold manner, outside of the cluster, outside of the file system, keep billions of files and petabytes of data in a cost-effective way for a really long time with great data integrity and all the things that you need. And it, doesn't, it moves beyond the limitations of how big can a file system go or how, um, how many objects can I store within a file system or how do I move my data from one tier of storage to another and pulling in third parties. All of it becomes native where you can natively address your storage and not introducing additional complexity. So the deep storage market is something the users absolutely need. And all the issues that we talk about of data growing faster than budgets and not enough people to manage all the different applications and products really lead to you need to start to build some of this natively into the storage. And, and that's where we really think the market will start to shift next year. Well, great, Molly. I guess, you know, kind of a wrap up here, uh, you know, when, when you rolled this out uh, in Boulder a couple months ago, I had the, the tough question was like, well, it, this seems like this is outside your sphere of influence, some of this stuff. I mean, how, how do you execute as far as partners and, and bringing this forward for the, the whole ecosystem? Yeah, it's, um, you know, in some ways it's new for Spectra. We've, we've been historically known as a tape library company for sure. We've been selling, we're in our fourth generation of disk products now. We, so we've been in the disk market for several years and introduced a new disk solution this year. But introducing new um, interfaces to storage is definitely new to us. And so we've done a couple things. We've brought in experts from other um, companies, other industries to help to make sure that we have experts doing exactly what they're doing, introducing RESTful web interfaces to the community. We also have really worked hard to talk to all of our partners and start to seed the market with some good adoption of this technology. So we have 65 different um, partners now that are in just a two-month period since we have announced it that are working on developing support for um, the DS3 interface. And what's really, really cool about it is a lot of these applications are ones that historically would only be able to move data to disk because they didn't know how to manage a tape library and a robot and move tapes around. We've done all that for them with our Black Pearl appliance. So We've, we've really leveraged the ecosystem partners we had and encouraged them to do development and we've helped them with our resources. And we have, uh, that we know of, 65 clients under development currently and there certainly could be others that we don't know about because the tools are available for the developers to do whatever they would like to as well. Well, great, Molly. It sounds like 2014 is going to be a, a great year for Vectra um, to move forward and execute. So uh, uh, looking forward to seeing more from you guys. Well, thanks. We're definitely very excited for it. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thanks again for coming on the show today. You bet. Thanks for the time and have a good holiday. You bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.